And I'm going to say happy Monday, everybody. I'm Noah Daniel, and you're here to talk about more than current events, a globally connected triad of tribes. While I wait to make sure everybody's tools are working properly, um, make sure that you're configuring your audio, and if you are tweeting about this, that you use the hashtag. Hello, Phil. Welcome. In just a moment, I'm going to go to the next slide. So get comfortable, everybody. I hope to have a wonderful time introducing what Bob is all about, telling you a little bit about the triad of tribobs, and then having a great conversation. So feel free. You can see that you can raise your hand while you're here if you have something pertinent, or you can ask a question in the chat. Thank you, Terry. Um, I've started the recording, so I'd like to take a minute and say thank you to our sponsors and supporters. It's because of you that this is accessible to people, that it remains a free opportunity to learn with each other, from each other, and really for each other. So thank you to the sponsors and supporters of this event and this particular presentation. Um, while I'm here, I'm so excited to see where you're all from. I am here just outside Toronto. If you click on the sunshine on the sidebar, Please let us know who's who's where. So I have a sense of the global conversation. So in the US. Okay. Nice. Nice. Thank you. If you have any trouble, Terry's here to help you out. Hi, welcome. We're just putting ourselves on the map literally and figuratively. So please feel free to use the tools and grab some sunshine and put yourself somewhere on that two-dimensional map. And once everybody gets a sense of where everybody's from, I'm going to begin. Oh, there are more of you than are on the map. Don't be shy. Oh, more Canadians. Or not. Do I get to figure out who's from where? No. Yay. Okay, well, I see a few of you feel comfortable putting yourselves on the map. Peru, amazing. Estefani, if you can just put um the sunshine on Peru, that would be great. Welcome, Thomas, or Tomas, depending. Oh, we got, so Risa's in Miami. I, can I put another star on for Risa? Let's put you there. You have been represented, Risa. And Dallas, Texas. So, Dr. Ahmad, I'm going to put Dallas. Would that be accurate for Dallas? A little bit higher? Do you want to do it? Long Island. Nice. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so excited that you're here. And I'm so excited to have the forum to talk about Bob and why these projects help to build global connectedness. So I'll wait just another minute or so. Guam, amazing. Hello, Elise, welcome. So excited to have you all here. Neat. I like this map. You changed it. I like that. Maybe somebody will teach me how to make a smiley face after. Oh, I got it. I got it. Changing my Toronto to a smiley face. Thank you for teaching me. Yes, what does SWBA stand for? Hmm. 
Well, we can learn that after. Thank you all for being here and spending this time with me. Um, my slides are loaded, and this is more than current events. Um, a few years ago, I had the privilege of articulating what it is that I had been doing in my classroom for a really long time, and I called it building outside the blocks, and I'll explain why. But essentially, I build outside the blocks, and it helps students and that's all that really matters to me. But over time, as I started to articulate what I was doing, it turned out I had what I call one-off and tri -bob. So we'll also explain the distinction between those two. And then, of course, what you're all here for, to hear about the What's News, What's Up, and News and Schmooze, a three-year experience of building skill over time and deepening understanding that builds global citizenship. So I'm going to continue by introducing what Bob is all about. Um, oh, students with our borders academy. Cool. Thank you for being here. Okay, so building outside the blocks, I call it Bob because I'm playful with my language and also because acronyms in education seem to go hand in hand. So they're personalizing projects that help students build skill, autonomy, and community in minimal class time. And these particular projects help us to build reading and writing skills, presentation skills, listening and other communication skills, and of course, critical and creative thinking. It helps students build organizational skills, and many of them help with media literacy. So I'm going to unpack which skills go with what and why this is really about building skill regardless of curriculum. Even though my focus is middle school, because that's what I have been doing, I'm sure there are lots of ways that you can play around with the projects and ideas, and I would love to talk about how you iterate. So please stay in touch with me if this is something you want to do. What I've noticed in the time that I have built these skills through these projects with my students is they get their hands into the world and they start to feel connected. When the global goals came out, I added them as a dimension to the project. So all of my outlines will have the global goals on it. Students have to identify where the information that their article comes from as well as which global goal it relates to. I envision a middle school where students are tracking which global goals have been discussed, which ones are missing, and at each stage of this iteration of TriBobs that I'm about to explain to you, students will explore what's, what's there and what's left out and really engage in a dialogue, not just check, up, check off on a list why these are important and how we can bring them into our classroom. So, there are these three aspects that all of my projects have. And even if these particular projects relate to social studies or history and geography, every student gets to choose when they present. And it turns out that this seems to be one of the things that they love the most about the project. So I might decide that this particular iteration of the project needs to happen over six weeks. And when I introduce the project, I will put the schedule up, I'll go through the assignment, and students will say, you know what, Mrs. Daniel, I want to go first, and I was that kid, or I wanted to go dead last because nobody could do the same thing as me. But some students really want to go last because they want to go last. And then other students kind of need to see a few presentations before they go. And what's wrong with that? Why would students all have to present the same thing on the same day? So this gets them an opportunity to not just determine when they're presenting within the teacher-selected parameters, but they get to own their personal schedule. They could say, well, I have a hockey tournament that week, so I really want to get it done before. My parents are taking me away on an amazing vacation, so I'd better make sure my work is done before then. One of my favorite parts about these projects, because they revisit themselves, is that students can say, the last time I went I went last, and it's, all it did was help me procrastinate more. I actually didn't take more ownership of my learning. So now I'm going to present somewhere in the middle. And even this conversation that they have with themselves, backwards designing in view of their self-selected deadline, helps to build agency. But the other aspect of this autonomy is that students get to choose how they present. And I'll show you how that manifests in the individuals and societies classes that I'm talking about. But in all of my classes, students create things that I couldn't have listed. And the idea that they have the opportunity to come up with how they would best represent their learning is part of the essential engagement that Bob's helped to breed. So 
that's the idea of the autonomy aspect, and I can speak more about it with specific examples. The community part is really something that I came up with many, many years ago, probably about 14. I started to get bored. My students were presenting, and the class was just listening, and I thought they probably need to take a more active role. So instead, I made sure all of my students could ask questions, provide comments, or give critiques. They were a vibrant audience of people who became coaches, modeling and articulating success criteria by saying, oh, that was a great presentation. Next time, please don't move from side to side. It makes it difficult to hear you. So the students are able to say to the presenter in a positive way how they could improve, and then they're actually saying how they themselves will be set up for success. So we become a community of coaches where students actually speak respectfully to each other and give the kind of formative feedback that helps them progress. And it creates a classroom culture where students are so excited. Who's presenting today? Yay, I'm next week. And people are really engaged in something bigger than themselves. But the other thing that makes Bob so particularly interesting and how I created them unknowingly from the beginning is the aspect of time. There's never enough time in teaching. So how do you create time when there isn't any? Well, you can reframe your perception of time and use it differently. So time, in terms of Bob, is used to introduce, model. I often will give the students exemplars and present. And most Bobs don't take more than five minutes, maybe 10 to present, but that's usually an exception. Sometimes I'll give start time, so kids might be really excited and they want to generate a brainstorming list before they go off on their own to go pursue the project. Or if there's some research involved and students need to get messy in the idea before they go work on their own. But most of the time is allocated to create the products that students bring to class happen at home. And so I use the word homework in quotation marks because it's self-directed work at home in view of a self-selected deadline. So it's students driving their own work and learning from mistakes. I've had students say, you know what, Mrs. Daniel, I waited till the last minute. What I should have done is given myself 20 minutes every single day to prepare, and I really didn't give myself enough time. Lucky for them, there's another Bob to come, and they can make that mistake, and they can iterate, and they can grow and scale forward. So that's the time aspect of the presentation. The teacher aspect is that I'm a facilitator. I put the agenda on the board. I help to manage transitions, make sure the presentations are ready to go, and I have to use the data that I collect from when the students are presenting. I take notes. I do a lot more filming than I used to, and I take a lot of pictures of the students. But really, I'm there to give feedback. So as an assessor, most of the time the feedback is formative, and students have opportunities through Bob and other classroom experiences to demonstrate improvement using that feedback. But there are certain times, as I'll explain with the TriBob, where they can be assessment as evidence for learning, where their first one in the TriBob can be diagnostic, and then formative, and then eventually summative. When I use the word accommodator, I don't mean it just for students who are identified. As any professional knows, we accommodate individual learners all the time when we're attuned to them. So the student is anxious. I don't need a piece of paper to tell me that they're stressed out. Sometimes I just have to look at them. So I'll give them opportunities to maybe record their presentation at home. Start by presenting to me at lunch or a small group and gradually release the audience to them so that usually by the end, and we've seen it happen many times, they can stand proud and tall in front of their class by the end of the year and present. And then this word that I've created, the creative collaborator, is when a student is considering a product for their Bob and they say, you know what, Mrs. Daniel, I was thinking about using this particular material and I say, oh, actually, I've been collecting this material and I think it might work better for you. So we'll have a very casual conversation and I'll get to collaborate on what it is that they're producing and the amount of time and energy that they put into the work that I'm just going to take this editing piece off. Yeah. Um, thank you. Sorry, one second. That they put into the work is so unbelievable that um, I'm so happy to be able to support them in any way that they want because they work so hard on each of the presentations. Um, 
So like I said, all the one-off spas, which can happen over a, a two-week, a six-week, a three-month cycle, build community and skills, take up minimal class time, and help students to experience autonomy, which for many of them is really liberating, and it's the first time they've ever had it. But the Tribob is really unique. And the idea of a Tribob is that you revisit the project multiple times, and at each spiral, you add a new layer or dimension so that students can actually act on feedback. And sometimes they'll even add a layer into a rubric that says demonstrates growth from previous feedback so that students know that this is longitudinal. It's not, OK, you get it or you don't get it, and then we move on. It really supports the process that learning is. And so students have multiple opportunities to build and deepen skills over time. And so I'm going to get to the specific details of the different BOBs in a minute. But all my BOB projects, somebody once said, oh, it's like project-based learning. So of course, when somebody says it's something, you need to show non-examples as much as examples. So I created this chart based on a graphic I found in Education Closet. The idea is that projects are something, and PDL is something else, and BOB is something else entirely. And I use a lot of project-based learning in my class. I'm not saying not to use it. But BOBs are something other, and they build different kinds of skills. Because project-based learning happens at school, you can collaborate with learners in process. You can help students in groups. But these are independent BOBs, and they really are a way to personalize learning. I get to know my students, what interests them, what drives them, how they learn the best. And it creates incredible conversations that melt the iceberg of the individual and really helps you teach them. So BOBs light people up. And whether it's because they learn about what they love or they learn about the products they like to create or the medium they like to play in or the ed tech that they always wanted to explore and found a reason to, BOBs do a lot. And I've been writing about them for the last few years. And every year I gather new data and share them. And they really are powerful project experiences because it's the approach, how all the aspects work in tandem for a learner. In middle school, however, I was given this incredible privilege to only teach individuals and societies, which is a middle years program of the International Baccalaureate course. But in Ontario, we still have Ontario curriculum. So in grades 6, 7, and 8, I was using MYP 1, 2, and 3 rubrics, which are skill-oriented and having to also meet curriculum expectations. So I always build outside the box. And I wanted to find ways for students to build skills over a year and then over the three years of middle school. And I had this vantage point that was really profound. So I created the What's News, the What's Up, and the News and Schmooze to give students opportunities to scaffold learning over a year and over the three years of middle school. Before I get into any of that, does anybody have a question about BOBs in general? Because I'm about to get super specific. OK, well, you'll let me know. Anyhow, the What's News experience. Oh, MIT is the Middle Years Program of the International Baccalaureate. The Middle Years Program is actually a five-year program, but because we were a middle school and we didn't have what we would call grade 9 or 10, MIT 4 and 5, we actually ended at MYP3. But it's a very unique and beautiful way of teaching and learning, and I'm forever grateful for having the experience. Because I teach in Ontario, I also can translate it to standards, expectations, and other things that are externally imposed. So I understand how to use these projects to meet those expectations while also teaching learning skills. So the West News, students in grade 6, sixth grade if you're from the United States, or MIT1 if you're in an IB school, experience the West News 1, 2, and 3. And at each revisit of the project, a new dimension is added. So at the beginning, students explore what makes something newsworthy. Who would be the audience? Why would we care? Why would we buy a newspaper, a magazine, go to the website to learn about that particular issue? And then it evolves through explicit instruction on annotating and summarization for students to actually interact with the text, ask questions, make comments, and summarize their news story. And eventually, they get to present it with visuals. And some of those visuals 
are literally presentation visuals, and some of them are a little bit more creative than that. And I'll speak about that with pictures of my students, because that's the best way to tell you about those artifacts of their learning. So the What's News one. Because each of the stages can't, can't be captured, I'm going to try to show you the evolution through their pictures. So besides capturing their glorious faces, totally engaged in what they're doing, students take what they're interested in, and then they reach across the world to talk about it, to engage in conversations about it, to teach each other about it, and to really be in touch. So these are sixth graders, and they're talking about the things that matter to them. Because they have to justify why they've chosen the topic that they've chosen, the critical thinking skills that are being built are perfectly age appropriate and again get revisited and built upon throughout the middle school experience. This particular student whose family or avid sports fan was incensed by the amount of mascot issue that was happening that she had never heard of. So she brought the issue to the class and she added a whole bunch of images that had nothing to do with her particular article because when you're passionate and engaged, students will spend extra amounts of time doing the work and trying to extend their learning and understanding only to bring that learning back to the class. So amazing conversations evolve. Students look up information from across the world and they bring it to the class, whether it's related to new technologies, but always, always something that they care about. So if there was anything robotic, this boy would find it, but the learning that he had, the building of the annotation skills, summarization skills, and presentation skills, the students do some of their best work through these kinds of projects. This is an example of what those annotations can look like. And this boy didn't want to do a presentation in its traditional sense. His visual, he felt, had to be made of plastic because that's what was found inside the stomach of the whale. So you can see the evidence of his learning both on the annotations on his paper and then the smile on his face as he shared it with the class. Now, I was sitting at the back of the room at that time and I had forgotten to take a picture when he was at the front, but I think he captures this nonetheless. And when you capture moments, the exact right time converges on amazing historical epic events in your country, you're aware of them and you get to say, I'm going to report on that. So when this happened this past year, the student was so excited and a few people really wanted to do this article, but he got there first. We try to limit the sharing in terms of repetition, but I always have conversations with my students making sure it's a choice that they're excited about and engaged in. So that's the idea of that evolution, that throughout the grade six year, students dip their toe in the idea of news and current events and eventually develop the skills in order to get messy in them and then share what they're learning with their class. And then comes grade seven and the West Up, which I created actually many years ago and has evolved a lot. All my projects have because they take student feedback and reflection as an opportunity for me to iterate my work. So the West Up has now become basically picking up from grade six where students annotate, summarize, and create a visual. And then they start to annotate, summarize, and start to look at bias presenting with the visual, start to look more critically at the text that they're seeing so by the time there's been explicit instruction on bias and the difference between fact and opinion, students are able to analyze the article and look at two articles on the same issue and notice the different perspectives in them. I'll explain in a minute about the decoding text because that's essential, the decoding photograph. So I wanted just to talk about how the grade seven year is much more about divergent thinking and getting students to build outside the blocks and think outside the box. So instead of looking at facts, they're looking to ask questions and go deeper and go beyond the text itself. So in that first stage, we go back to that exemplar of them being able to annotate text. Now this student is not the way all my students write, but he was a great annotator. So I always kept artifacts from his annotations. He asked questions and made reflections and really like there was one time that he presented this year that his article was 12 pages long and his annotations didn't get any less interesting or engaged throughout the entire article. It was truly amazing. Anyway, when the students present and they show their 
um, connection, you also get to see some of their learning. So this girl happened to do a color bash battle at camp, and she was curious about Holly. She learned that it was probably cultural appropriation that she did this at camp, but she also learned the real reason why the Hindu people celebrate Holly, and it became an illuminating experience for all of us. In this situation, when the students are presenting visuals, they really get to decide based on what the data is, based on what their current event is, based on the article that they're reading, and based on their interest, how they're going to share that in a visual. So I've had many students create models on your left. Um, this is a student who was talking about hoverboards and how they work. And so he brought in a magnet to show, and students got to come up and actually experience that. So they're teaching each other. They're using data management skills that they're learning in mathematics and showing how integrated learning really is great learning. Um, this particular student was doing an article on digging up fossils. And for him, this was a really, really great job of how he was depicting this article and what was being learned as a result. She was doing something on world leaders, and so she made this very long timeline of different world leaders who have impacted different countries throughout history. Of course, there are always models of volcanoes. This particular one on the right, in Australia, there had been a new pizza delivery robot, and that's what his article was about. But he thought it was insufficient to show the video because, again, he's so engaged. But he made a model and explained how there was a code that you get, and you could open it and get your very hot, warm pizza. And it was just a perfect reflection of how when you tap into the things that kids love, they don't look at the clock and wonder how much time they're spending because they're so deeply engaged in their work, and they're learning about the world at the same time. This is a seismograph. The student was doing something on an earthquake. The word seismograph was one minor aspect, but he was intrigued. What is a seismograph? And so he learned that you can actually make one. And so he did. And that's the beauty of giving students the power to create a product that best reflects what it is that they're learning about, because they do more than I could have ever imagined that they could do. Now, the web step two is about looking at bias. And sadly, last year was a big year for fake news. Lucky for us, there were a lot of great resources that came out, especially also from the Critical Thinking Consortium, TC Squared, and had a lot of different videos on fact versus opinion and how to be able to corroborate or triangulate data in order to make sure that it was a viable source. So I did a lot of explicit instruction on that before we got into the second stage of the WhatsApp. So students were looking critically at images and articles and wondering beyond the text why it was there, what were the issues that were being identified, where were the biases. And students chose things that mattered to them because they had to justify why they were their choices. And they noticed, I'll never forget, I had a student who for her first WhatsApp did an okay job and she was a pretty good student and in her reflection she said, I made the wrong choice. And then when she got to her WhatsApp too, she did it on hockey. And it was about the women's hockey and why women's hockey is poorly attended. And she was so passionate because her dream is to be in the Olympics and to think that for women that is all the other um, horizon that they can have in hockey because NHL type things don't always happen for women's sports. I mean, to hear her speak, to hear her be excited, to, to hear her learn from her mistake and say, you know what, really, um, that's so nice. I really um, have learned from my mistake. I mean, we talk about failing forward, but when students get to articulate that, that's really a, a prize moment in teaching. Copy pods were being banned in Europe and all over North America and staff rooms everywhere, we were seeing the Keurig up here. So for him, he chose this article to look at a contrast in cultures. And he deeply analyzed what it was wrong with coffee pods and maybe our culture. Oh, yay, please, I'll share everything with you, Jennifer. Anyhow, she was really, really into sports. And she always wondered why women's televised sports didn't get as much attention. So she chose an article on it. She chose to make a graph about it. And again, this was a person who would not speak in front of the class when she was in grade six. By the time she had gone through the three-part experience of a tribe of, she was writing grade seven to present to her class audience. And he had been to McDonald's. And because we were critically thinking, he looked at the toys at McDonald's and wondered, 
Why are there boys toys and girls toys at McDonald's? And through that inquiry, he chose an article on the topic and presented this very interesting, thought-provoking idea that there are, in fact, boys' toys and girls' toys, and that marketing looked completely different on girls' toys than boys' toys. And again, this was a current events idea that blossomed into something that was really driven by him and his interests. So, fantastic stuff. Now, the What's Up 3 is my favorite, and I'm going to tell you why, even though they're all my favorite. I started this thing called Friday Photo many years ago when I was a language arts teacher. And I used it primarily to look at media literacy and to see beyond the text. When I ended up teaching only individuals and societies, history and geography, I saw this decoding photographs as an opportunity to look at media as perspective. So it's a very interesting thing that every Friday the students would come into my class and they would go through four stages of decoding a photograph. Describe, analyze, interpret, evaluate. And what's great about the describe stage is it's very accessible. So you see a photograph and the students describe it. And I choose the photographs for the first two thirds of the year. And then once the students have done that for a long time and they've been assessed on those skills, they're ready to take it over. One of my favorite parts about this is when I first saw it, this was a red carpet situation during the film festival. I first saw it and I was like, wow, this is not going to get translated well in their generation. I don't think they're going to appreciate it. But it's something really compelling I thought I would try. Not only did they get it, when we get to so it, the describing phase is what do you see? It's pretty innocuous. I see a boy. I see a man. I see a woman. I see an older woman with glasses. Whatever they can see in the image and any words that they notice. And then they start to ask questions. So you can see where there are question marks in the red that they're starting to wonder. And then in the next stage, they start to interpret. So they take the data from the describing and from the analyzing, and they put it together, and they start to interpret, oh, this is a woman. They're on the red carpet. She's looking, and everybody else is looking at their phone. And then the evaluating stage is where we, we decide what this really means. And the students. Um, create titles for what the article um, headline would be. So a whole new world going old school, life without a screen. There's so much that comes out from these conversations and they're incredibly rich dialogue. I love Friday Photo and my students love Friday Photo and they, there's a big thing because I, I taught all the grade seven that 7A is not allowed to tell 7B what the Friday Photo is, but sometimes I'll get to know my students so well that 7A's Friday photo isn't 7B's Friday photo. It depends. I really spend a lot of time trying to find just the right picture. And sometimes a news event will happen that night, the night before Friday photo, and I throw it all out the window because there's something more current and prevalent that's just compelling me. So once I've done this for two thirds of the year, the students are ready to do it themselves. So this third stage of West Up, the students actually take two articles on the same subject. They compare and contrast them, and then they choose a photograph that best depicts what it is that they're learning about. And so this student, for example, was choosing something related to technology and how it creates antisocial behavior. She spent an hour looking for this photograph, but you can see the pride on her face as she reads the decoding of the text for her class, not just prepared to explain the photograph, but able to articulate what the nuance of the article is what the potential biases that lay there may be. Each student, according to their interests, choose the topic, choose the photograph, do the analysis, and really bring a lot of interesting conversations to the floor. We get a bevy of perspectives, and we try not to judge anybody. We just want to bring them all out and make sure that people are well represented. When the student brought this last year, I thought, oh, goodness, I have failed him. This is not a rich text. What could he possibly be doing? But at that time, Wonder Woman was being banned in Lebanon because Gal Gadot was Israeli. And it turned out that he actually thought a lot, of, a lot about this text. And he chose this exact one for a series of reasons related to self-protection and what it means to be fierce and how entertainment and politics can have blurred lines. It was amazing and impressive. And I was wrong about this one. Anyhow, whatever the students bring to the table becomes very interesting, illuminating into who they are as people. And again, as a data collector of my class, 
I learned so much about them, things that you would never be able to figure out by saying, hey, what are your interests? In terms of world events, what gets you excited about global outreach and building citizenship? We built citizenship together, scaffolded over time in stages. So that's the what's up to. Going from annotating, summarizing, and creating visual, to looking more critically at bias, to looking at how bias plays a role in terms of perspective of even the photograph and how to use those skills in critically evaluating a text. And then, last year, I had said to myself, okay, it's my second time teaching MYP3, grade 8. There must be something else I can do. And in the MYP3 rubric, the word collaboration kept coming out for me. There are so many times students have to collaborate, but when are they getting formative feedback on it? So that summer, I created News and Schmooze. And I do that a lot in the summer. I just walk around and I get an idea about a new Bob. And this is the Bob that I brought last year. So the idea of News and Schmooze is that students have a conversation about the news. And they build the ability to be independently accountable for preparing for the conversation and respectfully communicating with their group about the conversation that they agree on. So I'll go through each of those stages with you now. If I'm going too quickly, please let me know. I, I tend to get excited. I found this image and I thought it related really well to what this was all about. So really, news and schmooze is about coming together and then progressing together, and then ultimately producing something or working together. Um, so the first news and schmooze, the students meet as a group, and they agree on a topic. And for example, I had students, and I actually I had some great video of this first schmooze, but the video didn't work in, in this um, medium. So the students will agree, for example, to look at marijuana legalization. Judy Pye, who is a YouTuber, had paid some people in Africa to do something anti-Semitic, and he lost the Disney account, and that really engaged a lot of my learners. So the group decides what they want to investigate, and um, they go and they have a conversation about it. But how they have the conversation is what they get feedback about. So I film the conversation, and then they go home and they write a reflection about what they learned about themselves in the group. Because one of the things I've always disliked about collaborative work is when one person doesn't do something and then the whole group is held accountable for that. So I always try to create ways for there to be individual accountability in any scenario. Interesting about the Russian thing, I'm curious. Um, and then news and shoes number two originally was when the students in the same group um, create three to four different tableaux to tell the beginning, middle, and end of the story. But I've been reflecting on it a lot, and I would love to see news and schmooze around the world. Instead of doing mystery Skype or having a conversation with another class, if the other class of the same age group somewhere in the world agreed in small groups to explore a news story and then have a conversation about it, and adding a global element to that would certainly add dimension to the conversation and create awareness. Um, just something I'm toying with, but I'm happy to support anybody who wants to play with that. And then New Schmooze and Produce, which I also can show you, is a newscast where the students actually get to produce a newscast where different people get to be the anchor, different people get to be the person in the field, and they're creating something together based on their investigation, where again, everybody's individually accountable, and yet the group produces something. So essentially, that's the triad of a tribob. Each year, the tribob builds skill over the year and prepares students for the next year, where you can pick up from the same spot and build some more. And then, when they've built those skills, you can start to add and tease out different aspects of those just in time for them to add in collaboration and other learning skills. So the idea of a tribob is that there are multiple opportunities to revisit and build skills over a year. I have never before created a trifecta of tribobs, so it was a very interesting opportunity. And from the feedback from my students, not only were they well prepared for high school, but this building of skills over time respected every learner's need to take their time to do the process of learning on their own continuum and to really notice their growth, which helps a lot. So students get to look out on the world with new eyes, get to feel a part of that world, 
get to connect to the global goals explicitly by talking about which global goal is reflected in their article of choice. And then at the end of that iteration of the tribob, look at the whole class and maybe create data related to which areas weren't covered. What can I do to make people more interested in peace and justice, which is a point of reflection for the teacher? Instead of talking about the global goals, really get our hands messy in the global goals and get students to build citizenship and a sense of what's beyond the borders because there are no borders anymore. We live in a world where through collaboration and technology, everything is possible, but we have to get talking about it and that there's so much more that we can be doing. Thoughts are ways that students are able to self-direct their learning, grow from experiences, and really personalize for themselves, give data to the teacher who uses that data say, man, you're so interested in Christia Freeland and what she was doing. There's a really interesting article that I just saw, and I bring it to class, and that student reads it. So I'm able to really personalize from that point on using the data that I've collected from all my learners. And this is just what I did in social studies slash history slash geography slash individuals and societies. I have bobs for everything. So ultimately, these bobs connect students to the world to each other and to themselves. And those are all the ways that we can build successful learners. Thank you, making me so happy. Um, when I was creating my website this summer, I found this picture and I've never seen a better image to tell the story of what bobs are. Oops. I create frameworks for students, but what they build from there is absolutely individual and they can reach as far out as they want. So I know what the blocks are in school. I've always been the kind of person who builds outside of them, which isn't an easy thing to do. But through the building outside the block approach, students have a framework, an outline, a way to do something. But what they do with that is as individual as they are. So that's me. That's what I do. Besides teaching, building these projects is something that I just have been doing for so long and it turns out to, to really make a difference. So I built in time for you to ask me questions. Please ask me questions. Um, ask me anything. Let's play around with this. Who, who has their hand up? There's like a hand icon at the top. If you um, want to save something, I, I'm really appreciative of all this feedback. Thank you guys so much. Like, I, I want to share these projects with you and see how you take them and evolve them for your learners and create a dialogue around how um, these can be strategies for personalization and also for building skill over time. So please, if you do want an outline, just write to me, noah at buildingoutsidetheblocks.com. I'll send you the outline in a malleable way. You can tweak it any way that works for your students. But I've done this and spent the time because it matters to me. We have a question on uh, uh, special education students. I'm yeah. happy to share. Um, I'm seeing no questions. Please ask me a question. Hmm. Yes. Oh, perfect. So with special education students, um, I'm for the very first time in my life, I'm working in public school. I've always been in a private school. And the word special education doesn't look the same in private school as it does in public school. Um, I am learning that all of these projects can be modified or accommodated to meet the needs of learners. And the truth is that most often it's those special ed students that need that connection to make them excited about their learning. So you can create lots of different versions of an outline. I know for my students I have um, pages of work that I have chunked for them. So I'll take the same assignment, change the language. All of my stuff is universally designed. So when you look at it, you'll see checklists to help students stay organized. You'll see self-induced mini deadlines. So those things help many different kinds of learners. But if I have a learner that's ELL, I'll change the language of something. I'll create audio to support them. I'll create different ways um, to show them how to do something. And that's why I often use exemplars that I share with the students so they have something to see. I know a lot of people are afraid to do that. They're like, well, I don't want the kids to only do that. But they don't because when you create a building outside the block kind of culture, they know that this is just one way of doing something and there is no wrong way as long as you're meeting the assignment criteria. So everything can be um, attuned 
to the individual learner, and you can absolutely integrate special education students into the project and into the into the presentation part. I mean, communication can look different for so many children, and I've learned through the ASD class that I've worked in a little bit that there are so many ways to get to the same place, and ramps are easily built. So I can show you how to do it. Um, thank you, Terry, for that. But yeah, it's it's accessible. Um, not necessarily for the higher order thinking skills, but there's nothing wrong with creating baby steps to try to get everybody there. Again, thank you. Okay, so as I said, yeah. So not this particular Bob. Um, I have Bob that I created from grade three and up. I don't see how they can work in grade one and two, but if you go on my website and look at the different Bob projects, I've done master storyteller in grade three. I've done the extra in grade three. I've done a lot of things in the grade three year that I've changed. Like I've done poets in grade three. Poets is much better in grade six, seven, and eight, but everything can be adaptable to the learner's age, grade level and the expectations can change according to the standards or expectations or curriculum of that province or state or wherever. Um, oh goodness, I don't know about a model Bob classroom. How cute is that? I love that. Um, but I can show you lots of pictures of my students' work. They're all on my website. And that's the thing, like, it wasn't me that realized I was doing something cool. The kids were doing cool things. And my mentor said to me, why are your kids all doing cool things? And I went, I don't know. It's like I'm building outside the block. But I don't know what that is. And over time, um, oh, good. So we'll give you the mic. Over time, that's what I started to call it. And that's what I do. So. Um, Terry, are you going to give Phil the mic? Yeah, Phil. Hold on. Your mic is open. Go for it. Oh, if you press the top um, okay. bar at the bottom underneath my okay. face. All right. Thank um, you. Um, there you go. Hi, I Phil. New York State, um, grade four, and so there's a lot in terms of the Common Core, and I see there's, uh, you know, that you're kind of going beyond the Common Core, at least what we're doing in the classroom. Um, I guess my question is. How, do you, how did you try to convince other people in your school um, that this is the way to go, that this is the direction that it should be going, rather than sticking to common core skills, per se, even though that they might feel that they're stressed because they need to cover that aspect of the curriculum? So I guess my question totally. is, how do you convince others? How do you get them on board? So it's a funny question on a couple of levels. One of them is, I've never tried on purpose to onboard anybody. Um, people come into my classroom. My classroom kind of happened to be the place that they always brought parents in to. So parents or teachers would say, hey, what is this thing that you're doing? And so I started to talk about it. And that's why I even conceived of writing about it. I didn't know I was doing anything different. And this is kind of the worst, best part about me is I've always been building outside the block. So yes, I can meet all the standards. If you look at your standards, and I'm happy to have a conversation with you after, Phil, these can meet all those expectations, but they can also build beyond those expectations to build authentic and transferable skills that create the citizens that we need to have in a global world. So um, I didn't ask permission. I have never really asked permission, but lucky for me, my students and the parent communities that have supported me for the last 22 years have seen that their learners are deeply engaged um, are always talking about the project as kind of the pinnacle of their experience and learning, and uh, it, it makes it viable somehow, I guess. But I'm pretty sure that I can show any person how I meet expectations in the box, in the box, in the curriculum, and I think that students do the best job of explaining how they go beyond. Like in grade four. Um, I did something called Master Storyteller, which is a tri-bob where students begin very simply by reading a picture book to the class, and then the next stage of the tri-bob is where they create a presentation of some kind of product, go with a different picture book, and then in the third stage, because I've explicitly taught them writing skills over the year, uh, they actually present their own original story with visuals. So I've given them the entire year to build a sense of what story is, to literally become master storytellers. And then I read Daniel Pink's book, and I was like, yeah, storytelling's a thing. So it seemed that I was on the right track. But I have lots of things for elementary that I can help you with. And I've been toying with the idea of kind of creating the precursor to 
uh, the Tribal Triad in Grade 5. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about what that could look like because I like to collaborate. Um, I thought that could be a Bob teacher. Interesting. Um, yeah, probably that's true. That's true. I've never thought of a Bob teacher like a certification. You just kind of made my day. I This approach that I've created, people use. So I don't know always how people can use them, but I understand from the different people that I shared it with um, that they're really great for ELL. I have a project called What's in a Name that I give away on Teachers Pay Teachers because I believe that cultural literacy is something that will also help us become global citizens. So names are perfect ways, um, avenues into people's culture, people's beliefs, the things that matter to people. So students interview their parents or caregivers as to why their name was their name or they do research on their name, the etymology what it means to them, why it was chosen for them. Do they like it? Do they think that it actually is the right name for them or do they have an alternative? And through that we learn about their immigration stories. We learn about the things that their parents love and who they think they really are. And for me I use it as a diagnostic in social studies, but it can be applied in so many different ways at so many age groups. And my friend Carol Salva in Texas, who is an ELL expert, started using it with her high school students who are new to the country. And she's so great at promoting this Bob because people have been calling me and asking me for the outline because it really helps the LL learners say, hey, I'm here and this is my story without saying, hey, what's your story? So it's a lot better than a laundry list and a fill in the blank. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. And it certainly is a great way to build a class community. Other questions? We have eight minutes. Oh, and I think I have to stop early to to stop the video, is that right? Okay, I'm just going to go down the list and see anybody else has a question. Okay, yay, smiley faces. Okay, well, I'm around, but definitely take a look at the website. Let me know if there's an outline that interests you. I don't make any of them PDFs because I want people to be able to manipulate them and do what they need to to make it work for their class because Bobs are all about personalization, but um, thank you. I'm I'm so grateful. I just want to say thank you before I end this. I want to say thank you to all of you for being here. I want to say thank you, thank you to to oh my goodness to Steve and to Lucy for creating this opportunity. I was saying to Terry at the beginning, I didn't even know that I was creating global connection. I just knew that I was doing some cool stuff related to the world. And because of this Global Education Conference, I actually realized that I was doing something really different with this triad. So I'm happy to share it and I'm happy to talk about how we can look at these years in a more connected way. And even though the standards might build on each other or the curriculum might build on each other, kids need to feel connected to that building and that's what Bob's can do. So yes, as Terry is writing, I believe the recordings are available within 24 hours, they were saying. Um, but you don't need the recording, you can just reach out to me and I'm happy to talk about it. I love to talk about students and learning and growing and evolving. Um, thank you so much. It's so funny that Reese is, that's my favorite compliment is that people want to hang out in my classroom. So. Um, Let's, let's create a global classroom together and let's create a society where people learn skill by connecting to each other. So it, it seems I have to stop the recording. I'm going to just give you any more opportunity. If anybody has a question, now is the time to raise your hand. Okay, well you know how to find me, Noah, at Building Outside the Box. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Everybody, stop the recording. everybody has to leave the room before we can stop. Oh, the before recording. I can. <gasps> Thank you, Terry. Yeah, okay. it doesn't work. Well, you don't have to leave the room for six minutes, but I really appreciate you being here, and I so appreciate you spending this time with me. Thank you. And if you would like to leave the room, that's cool, too. Hmm. I really almost messed that up, Terry. This is fun. You had a, you obviously had a great time doing this. You, you, <laughs> okay. did, you did so well too. Oh, thank you so much. I really like I I love it. I really love it.
I can't believe people are talking about dog certification. That's the coolest thing that's happened to me today. I do know uh, on, on the name Bob, I think you ought to look up Bob Greenberg and possibly Bob. think about being interviewed by him. He has a, a channel called the Brainwaves channel where he interviews uh, thinkers of all sorts in education. If you search YouTube for Bob Greenberg's Brainwaves channel, um, you'd, you'd find it. But um, I think he would like to interview you, would be my guess. That's so nice. I just decide that he's like, I, I just suggest it and solicit it. <laughs> how do I do that? Terry? Oh, how do you do what? I, I've never just inquired about somebody interviewing me before. How, how does one go about doing that? I'm going to tell Bob about you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bob, right. um, we have a global education conference, conference at Radford, and Bob comes down and presents, and he also brings his cameras down, and he always records several people and puts those on his site while he's there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass your name along to him. See, if, if, he's in uh, Connecticut. He's up in what towns he? I can't think of his town right now, but not probably not too far from Toronto. Well, I, even the suggestion, that's so kind of you, and I appreciate it. I, I love talking about this, so it's my pleasure to ask anybody who wants to talk about pretty much anything education with me. I love it. Well, you have something unique to offer here. Thank you. That feels really good. It's platforms like this, just like with the students, where you feel like you have a voice and feel like, what you think and do matters that, that builds you up and makes you want to keep working. So thank you very, very much. OK, everybody, thank you. Oh, no, there are still people in the room. Good night, Veronica and Paul and Estefani and Mohammed, Dr. Ahmed. Ahmad. Ahmad. Ooh. Have a lovely evening. Thank you so much for being here. It's fun to watch the left. Okay, that's just us now, Terry. I think they're all out now. Okay, yeah, so oh. Bob Greenberg, I'm definitely going to pass your name along. Um, actually, I can't believe I can't think of his name. He's a good friend of mine. We work together a lot. Um, I can't remember the name of his town. So anyway, I'm going to pass your name along. And if you look up the Brainwaves channel, you'll find that he, inter he interviews quite a, a wide variety of people. And uh, I'll just pass your name along and, and then uh, see what happens with that. OK, well, thank you, really. All right. Um, we still have Veronica in the room, so we have to wait. And then I can stop the recording. You can still be there, correct? OK, let's see here. OK. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and leave. And then, uh, hey, it's been great to, to meet you this way. And, OK, hopefully uh, I'll see you in your session. Pardon me? I'll, I'll be in your session, hopefully, as a, as a volunteer, as a participant. OK, sure. Come come do that. And uh, I'll, when I email Bob, I'll copy you on the email also. OK, thank you. OK, well, I'm out of here. Yes. Hi, Veronica. I can't close until you go, although I'm happy to have you. I don't know how to do that. OK. Bye, Carrie. I'll see you soon.